Greetings, and welcome to another online vodcast lesson that provides you principles and practice for rhetorical criticism. This lesson is actually going to be conducted in two parts uh, because there's a lot to uh, the larger framework of neo-Aristotelian criticism. So we're going to take it one chunk at a time and focus not just on the overall steps of neo-Aristotelian criticism, explaining what that actually means and why we should care, but then focusing on two primary components of that process that actually can fold into most other forms of rhetorical criticism as well. Uh, that's an understanding of the context, uh, and there's a couple of different ways to understand it, but one important one is Bitzer's notion of the rhetorical situation. And then the other element, which we'll talk about in part two, is uh, the artistic proofs of persuasion, according to Aristotle. But let's start out at the beginning. What do we mean by neo-Aristotelian criticism? Well, you can probably guess by the clever name that uh, the notion comes from the theory of rhetoric provided by Aristotle in his treatise on rhetoric in ancient Greece. In On Rhetoric, Aristotle defines rhetoric as the ability, in a particular case, to identify the available means of persuasion. Now, what's important about this definition uh, is a couple of things. First of all, it's important to note that while uh, this idea is certainly important for folks who want to construct and present persuasive messages, and so you would want to be able to identify the means of persuasion in order to persuade people, but also it's an important idea with regard to rhetorical critics as well as any public audiences of persuasive messages. If you're able in a particular case to identify the available means of persuasion, this makes you a more discerning and critical audience member so that while you may well be persuaded by a message, you can do so with your eyes and your brain wide open as opposed to, well, you know, just going with it because it sounds really good. Uh, more specifically, there's two key elements of this definition that we want to pay attention to as rhetorical critics. The first is where Aristotle says that it's the ability in a particular case. As we may remember from a previous vodcast lesson in this series, uh, uh, rhetoric is a situated form of communication. It always takes place in a particular context. So if we're going to engage in neo-Aristotelian criticism, we have to have an understanding of the particular case. The other piece of the definition, of course, that's crucial is the available means of persuasion. So in part two of this two-part uh, series on neo-Aristotelian criticism, we're going to focus specifically on the means of persuasion that Aristotle articulates. But how do we go about the process of neo-Aristotelian criticism more generally? Sonia Foss breaks this process down into some very easy steps. First, we need to reconstruct the context. Uh, which is essentially the particular case that Aristotle is talking about. Uh, what is the overall environment uh, situation or uh, larger context in which a persuasive act takes place? The second step is to apply the five classical canons to the artifact. These are the five primary elements of how rhetorical messages get produced and presented that have been articulated in rhetorical theory and education uh, in classical Greece and Rome. And we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. And then finally, uh, the critic needs to assess the impact of the artifact on the audience. Once we have an understanding of the context, and then we have an understanding of how the message is designed and constructed and presented within that context, then we can draw some conclusions about what sort of effects, if any, this message can or might be anticipated uh, to have on an audience. So in order to engage in this discovery, we're going to work through a specific example of contemporary rhetorical discourse. Specifically, an advertisement entitled Firms. Uh, this was a political campaign ad that was run by the Obama for America re-election campaign in 2012. So as we talk about the specific elements of neo-Aristotelian criticism, we'll come back to this ad and try to figure out how these ideas might apply in a particular case. So. The first step of neo-Aristotelian criticism is to reconstruct the context. Now, when we're trying to figure out about the context, there are a few things that we're going to need to explore. Uh, we'll probably want to get information about the rhetor or the persuasive communicator. Uh, what do we know about this message source? Uh, what do we know about what their background is? What are they trying to achieve in this particular context? Do they have any specific goals or objectives or problems that they're trying to solve? We want to try to have an understanding of the occasion. Uh, when is this uh, communication act taking place? Where is it taking place? Under what circumstances? 
And we want to have an understanding of the audience. Uh, to whom is this message directed? Uh, what do we know about the target audiences? Why have uh, these listeners or readers been targeted? Uh, why does the writer want to persuade this particular group of people or this particular institution or whoever it is the audience might be? And so when we do the research into understanding the rhetor, the occasion, and the audience, there are a number of different perspectives that we might take. So how do we understand context? Well, one way is through the rhetorical situation, a concept developed by Lloyd Bitzer in 1968. A second way uh, comes from the uh, tradition of critical cultural studies, and that's John Fiske's notion of supertext. And finally, we can understand uh, from social theory, specifically from Michel Foucault, the idea of the discursive formation. We'll take each of these ideas in turn, but first of all, as a general point, it's important to emphasize that this is not something that we just make up off the top of our heads or we get a gut instinct about based on our understanding of the text. In order to really understand rhetorical context, this involves research. You need to do some reading, you need to do some investigating. Uh, everything from academic research sources uh, to uh, journalistic publications, uh, especially in the case of a contemporary public address, but we need to find evidence that's out there that gives us a good indication of what we know about the rhetor, the occasion, and the audience, uh, and the overall situation. So while in this particular exercise we're going to be operating based on our background knowledge of the 2012 presidential campaign in an actual rhetorical criticism project, you need to get to the library and you need to get online to do your research. But let's just start exploring the context. The rhetorical situation is a really simple but powerful idea by Lloyd Bitzer. The overall notion is that communication takes place in specific, particular contexts and circumstances. Indeed, Bitzer argues that a rhetorical act is called into being by a particular situation. The reason why a rhetorical act happens in the first place is because the rhetor has some sort of intention. There's something that I want to or need to accomplish. And that goal or that objective is something that is brought upon by a particular situation. So the environment, the setting, the audience, uh, broader variables regarding the society and the culture surrounding uh, this rhetorical occasion, that's what defines the situation. And so then the goal of the communicator, uh, we'll often use the term rhetor in this context to uh, describe the persuasive communication source. Their goal is to provide an appropriate or a fitting response to that situation. Based on the circumstances that I find myself in, how is it that I design this message in order to respond to those elements of the situation that I'm facing? And this idea has its roots, uh, as most ideas in uh, rhetorical theory and criticism, uh, from the rhetoric of ancient Greece. The notion of kairos is an important idea of time for the Greeks. While chronos referred to clock time, uh, chronological time, uh, minutes and hours, days and weeks, kairos refers to situational time. Uh, think of it as a window of opportunity. Uh, to exercise uh, or to take advantage of kairos means uh, to provide a timely, opportune response to a situation. Uh, taking a window of opportunity uh, to respond in the best way possible, uh, given what you know about the situation. So providing a fitting response to the situation is uh, an exercise of kairos. So, in order to get a sense of this, what I want to do is, first of all, give you an opportunity to see the Obama for America 2012 ad entitled Firms, uh, so that you have an overall understanding of what it is we're getting ready to analyze. And then we'll start unpacking what the elements of the rhetorical situation might be uh, in this situation. Let's watch the ad. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with bright. Okay. So now that we have an understanding of the message we want to analyze, let's start thinking about the rhetorical situation faced by the Obama campaign uh, to which this ad is a response. For Bitzer, there are three primary elements of the rhetorical situation. 
The first is the exigence, sometimes referred to as the exigency. It's kind of a tomato tomato thing. When we're talking about rhetorical exigence, we're talking about the rhetor's goal, defined by a problem which demands a response. As I mentioned previously, all rhetoric is intentional. And so a primary thing that you'll want to do when researching the rhetorical situation is to try to determine what is the goal that um, the rhetor wants to uh, achieve. Uh, what outcomes uh, is this persuader looking for? What problems are they looking to solve? The second element of the rhetorical situation is the audience. Now it may seem pretty self-explanatory. The audience is going to be the receiver of the message, right? Well, for Bitzer, understanding the audience in a rhetorical situation is important uh, when you think about uh, the larger sense of uh, the rhetorical situation. What makes an audience rhetorical? For Bitzer, the rhetorical audience are hearers with the capacity and the will to act on the exigence. In other words, I'm not just going to put a persuasive message out there just randomly to any old buddy I, I feel like. Uh, if I want to achieve a goal or to solve a problem, I need to target certain hearers or certain viewers or certain readers uh, because somehow they've got the ability uh, to help me accomplish what I want to accomplish. Uh, if they don't have the ability or they would never have the inclination to help me solve my problem or achieve my goal, then there's little point in trying to persuade them. So we want to try to understand who those audiences are. Um, why are they being targeted? Uh, what sort of qualities or characteristics do they have? Uh, what are their feelings, values, beliefs, attitudes that are going to be relevant to the situation that may have an impact on how this message gets designed and put together? The third element of the rhetorical situation are constraints. And constraints are essentially those contextual elements which limit the available options for persuasive communication. In other words, I can't just do anything I want to uh, in a rhetorical situation in order to provoke a response. Well, I suppose I could, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work. Uh, there are certain things you just can't do. There are also some things that are kind of a bad idea to do. There are certain things that would be a pretty good idea to do and there are certain things that you would have to do in that situation so the constraints limit what options you have available now of course the flip side of the coin is that situations can potentially enable certain options it can make certain things that you can do in the message available that might not otherwise be available in different situations so you want to have a good understanding of the surrounding circumstances uh, in this rhetorical context. Uh, what kinds of elements in the situation are going to put limits or challenges on what the rhetor can say and how they can say it? And are there any elements of the situation that make certain options available or possible that might not otherwise be? So let's think about it in terms of this ad. What are the Obama campaign's exigences? Okay, you've had an opportunity to think about it. Here's some ideas that I've got. Certainly, uh, a key rhetorical exigence in the 2012 campaign is to get reelected. And so uh, the ultimate goal is to beat Mitt Romney and uh, to get enough electoral votes to win. But let's get a little bit more specific than that. Uh, Obama, given this situation, needs to convince voters that, uh, that he's better than Romney on the issues of the economy and jobs. Uh, if we research the context of the 2012 campaign, we find out that uh, the sluggish economy that never really quite recovered uh, successfully from the economic crash of 2008 uh, was the most important issue uh, on the minds of voters as well as on the minds of the media and the larger political establishment. And this was the key uh, competition point between Obama and Romney in the campaign. So Obama needs to establish that he's better on the economy and better on jobs than Mitt Romney is. Okay, so given the exigences, the next thing that we need to try to determine is who might be the rhetorical audiences that Obama needs to reach. All right, so you've had an opportunity to brainstorm that a little bit. Again, here's some thoughts I've got. Duh. He needs to uh, target American voters, uh, the people that are potentially going to vote for president, because they've certainly got the capacity and will to act on the exigence. If they're going to vote in the campaign, there's a possibility that they can vote for Obama. It makes them a rhetorical audience. But certainly that's really broad and internally diverse. And if we do good re research on the rhetorical situation, we're going to be able to drill down into some more specifics. What's going to be really important for the Obama campaign to reach are independent, undecided voters. Uh, that 20 to 25 percent of the electorate in most elections uh, that uh, could be potentially swayed either way. Uh, 
Uh, there's going to be a number of hardcore Republican voters or hardcore ideological conservatives that are just not going to vote for Obama no matter what happens. So they're not really going to be a focused target audience for this message. There's also going to be some really hardcore Democrats or ideological liberals or progressives that are squarely in Obama's camp and he doesn't really need to worry about them all that much. But there's going to be a group in the middle, um, weak, less committed Republicans, weak, less committed Democrats, and then those independent, undecided swing voters in the middle that really need to get targeted. This is especially going to be true in certain swing states. In other words, states that aren't reliably Republican or Democratic. Uh, in 2012, there are a number of states like this, including uh, Florida, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio, North Carolina. And so targeting voters in these kinds of states is going to be particularly important. And certainly, given the centrality of the economy and jobs in this uh, particular situation, targeting working class families is essential to Obama's rhetorical situation. The folks that are hit the hardest by the economic downturn, especially those uh, that have lost jobs or are in fear of losing their jobs, um, and a lot of these folks, incidentally, happen to be in that position of being an independent, undecided voter in some of these industrial swing states, especially in states like Ohio. So it's an absolutely crucial audience for Obama to reach. Okay, the final element of the rhetorical situation, as we know, are the constraints. So take a moment to brainstorm. What kinds of constraints are uh, present uh, in President Obama's situation? What sort of factors might limit or challenge the rhetorical options he has available? Now remember, these can have to do with the broader political, social, and cultural context. It can have to do with the specific occasion of the campaign. It could have to do with uh, the available media or channels of communication that are available to Obama. But what are the limits? What are the challenges? And are there any possible opportunities uh, that he might be able to take advantage of uh, that are enabled by this situation? Okay, think you got some ideas? Here's some of mine. One constraint that's going to be present whenever we're, we're talking about campaign advertising is the fact that they're very short. Uh, they tend to be no more than you know, 30 to 90 seconds at a clip. And so you need to be able to pack in an effective, uh, persuasive argument within a very short period of time. And at the same time, uh, these are ads that are expensive to produce, but more importantly, expensive to buy. Uh, if you're campaigning, you need to be able to uh, carpet bomb uh, these swing states with lots and lots of t political television advertising in order to reach the voters that you want to reach and to convince them over a period of time. So we've got a real tension here. Uh, lots of folks say that they don't like political advertising. Uh, lots of folks like to skip right past commercials. Um, so you've got to pack in a message in a short period of time. It's really expensive, but it's also a medium that a lot of voters like to skip because they say they don't like them. So you're going to have to grab their attention and compel them for that 30 to 90 seconds uh, in a way that's persuasive and cost effective. Now, another constraint that Obama faces is with regard to his political uh, track record and specifically on the economy. He was elected in 2008 after the crisis on a platform of being able to recover the economy uh, after its collapse under uh, President George W. Bush. But three and a half years later, the economy is still weak, still vulnerable, and so his public approval ratings, especially with regard to economic and jobs policy, were pretty anemic at this point in time. So uh, this is a vulnerable area for Obama. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there that aren't convinced uh, that President Obama is really the best person for the job, uh, specifically on um, the uh, area of jobs and the economy. Now, the flip side of that coin is that Pre uh, Governor Mitt Romney uh, was perceived as a pro-business candidate, and based on his business expertise, uh, in his earlier campaign efforts, he was framed as someone who was strong on the economy. They understood how businesses work. Uh, he understood how economic growth operates. He understood the relationship between business and growth and developing jobs. And so um, there were a lot of folks out there that thought that Romney was a superior candidate to Obama on the area of economic policy and being able to stimulate growth and develop jobs. 
However, there was also an element of this situation that Obama was able to take advantage of, a window of opportunity. And that is, while a lot of folks thought that Mitt Romney uh, was very strong in his business expertise and potentially strong on the economy, there was a widespread, pretty pervasive sense that Romney was uh, a rich elite that was uh, out of touch with um, the uh, the plight of the working class. Um, he was the kind of person who didn't really understand what it was to be a blue collar worker. Um, he didn't understand what it was to be an ordinary American. He was amazingly wealthy and uh, in particular there were attacks during the campaign uh, that during his time working for Bain Capital uh, he was responsible for the acquisition of uh, companies and subsequent liquidation of them, breaking them apart and unemploying the workers. Now, to be fair, uh, Romney's company was also involved in acquiring companies, building them up, and providing employment for lots of workers. But there was still this sense that Romney was struggling throughout the campaign to try to construct himself as somebody who was in touch with ordinary Americans, because a lot of people just didn't buy it. Now, you can imagine, and you get a sense of this from the advertisement, that the Obama campaign knows that this is a vulnerable area for Romney and so may potentially be able to take advantage of that public perception and maybe start changing the game on the perception that uh, Romney's better on the economy than Obama is. All right, so that's the rhetorical situation. There are a couple of other elements of context that we can understand as well. One comes from John Fisk in crit uh, Critical Cultural Studies, and that's the idea of the supertext. Supertext is a different way of understanding a rhetorical context. According to Fisk, as uh, paraphrased by Jody Cohen in her book Communication Criticism, the supertext are the texts that precede and follow the text and become relevant to its meaning. In other words, uh, this particular uh, advertisement, uh, just like any rhetorical text, is going to be informed by all of the other rhetorical communication that took place prior to it. The notion is that all messages respond to and often incorporate uh, previous messages. And then uh, the, uh, the text becomes part of this larger supertext that might then contribute to later messages. So what you need to think about is, uh, in the case of a uh, political campaign advertisement, what other rhetorical messages were already out there that provided a basis both for the rhetor, in this case the Obama campaign, um, to provide resources for them uh, to put together the message uh, based on their experiences and their reactions to other rhetorical messages that were out there. But then the supertext is also important uh, for the rhetorical audience that's being targeted. Uh, the American voters that were out there were also exposed to a number of different rhetorical messages regarding the campaign, regarding the economy, regarding uh, news coverage of these economic and jobs issues, and so forth. So what you want to do is think about, in this situation, what do you suppose Obama's supertext is? Might there be particular kinds of messages uh, that the campaign might be informed by uh, and or are there particular kinds of messages uh, that um, the audience may be familiar with uh, that the Obama campaign is going to take advantage of as they construct and present this message. Okay, here's some thoughts that I have on the super text for the Obama campaign. Certainly, previous campaign rhetoric and news coverage on Obama, Romney, and the campaign. Uh, in particular, uh, news coverage with regard to Romney's background is something that's especially important in this message. And uh, you could probably see evidence of that in the construction of the message itself. Uh, there are a number of quotations uh, from a variety of different news and information sources providing information about Romney and his activities. And uh, this is part of the supertext. Um, we of course have the, the super text of previous patterns of campaign ads. Um, the Obama campaign is familiar with how campaign uh, ads operate uh, and so those kinds of messages are going to inform the way that they put the message together. Subsequently uh, the audience of this ad have presumably seen lots of political advertisements before so they have a sense of how these ads work, how they're structured and uh, how it is that they can perceive meaning from them. Then, of course, there is the song itself, America the Beautiful. Uh, this is a song that existed well before the 2012 campaign. Uh, the Obama campaign is certainly familiar with it, as are many, if not most, Americans. And so because we have a previous understanding of that song, what the song's about, and what it means, 
then that's going to provide an important resource for the ad because then when the song gets deployed, deployed in the ad the way that it is, it provides a basis for our understanding of the larger meaning of the ad in a richer way. And then, of course, you know, there's all kinds of other elements of supertext. Um, in particular, one that's especially important is uh, the uh, situation that frames the rest of the ad. Uh, the campaign uh, stop where Mitt Romney actually sang the song uh, "America Beautiful," uh, "America the Beautiful," uh, to a rally of campaign supporters. In a number of different speeches throughout the campaign, uh, Romney would recite lyrics to the song and use that as a jumping-off point uh, for various pieces of his stuff speech. But at this particular rally, uh, a member of the campaign suggested that maybe he should just sing the song, that it would be an endearing moment uh, for uh, the folks that attended the rally. And for the folks that attended that particular rally, it did seem like a really nice moment. But the Obama campaign recognized a, a somewhat of an ironic opportunity to take his singing of America the Beautiful in the off-key way that he happens to sing it uh, and counterpoint it with other elements of Romney's background available from the super text in order to put together a powerfully ironic statement. The final element of uh, situational context that we might be interested in is what Michel Foucault refers to as the discursive formation. According to Foucault's theory, uh, discourse constructs a system of communication rules that govern knowledge. In other words, the way that we understand reality itself, what is true, what is reliable and credible information, um, how it is that we think and act, is driven by discourse is driven by the ways in which language in particular kinds of disciplines especially construct rules for what is true, what is false, what is valuable, what is not valuable, what is beneficial, what is detrimental. And so understanding those rules helps us understand the way that we perceive our reality. Because the way we perceive our reality is driven by this discourse that defines what is real, what's true, what's right, what's valuable, and so forth. So, consider for a minute the discursive formation uh, that the Obama campaign might be dealing with. What sorts of communication rules or norms or practices uh, in this kind of context are going to govern how the Obama campaign is going to put together a message like this? And or how the audience is going to perceive and make sense of a message like this? So, this is a bit more complicated, um, but I'll give it a shot as well. There are rules and norms for election campaigns and campaign ads. Uh, there are certain things uh, that uh, campaign ads are legally bound to do. Uh, for instance, if it's in an ad that comes from the official campaign, there needs to be a disclaimer statement. Uh, I'm Barack Obama and I approve this message. Uh, those kinds of, that kind of disclaimer isn't as necessary uh, for internet ads, but they're certainly important for broadcast ads. But beyond just the rules of campaign finance and campaign advertising that are legal, there's a whole host of rules and norms uh, based on our expectations of what campaign ads are supposed to do, what you can get away with, what you can't get away with, uh, what's a legitimate form of attack, uh, what are forms of attack that might be crossing the line. And so the Obama campaign has to have a good understanding of the norms for campaigns and campaign advertising because they know that the audience has a similar sense of what the rules and norms are. And beyond that, there are cultural norms and expectations that have been constructed by American political and cultural discourse literally for centuries about the nature of American values. Uh, the whole idea of America as a nation itself, according to someone like Foucault, is constructed by discourse. We understand a nation and we understand our identity as citizens of that nation based on the way we articulate it in our communication. And that includes the values that are American values. So for instance, uh, the mythic uh, norm of the American dream that most of us are familiar with. Uh, the idea that comes out of a centuries old mythology that if you work hard and play by the rules, you have the opportunity for success. This is a particular uh, set of discursive norms, uh, a discursive reality, if you will, that the Obama campaign knows that the American people embrace. And uh, another element of the discursive formation regarding American values and American political culture are the ideas of family, work, and patriotism being core centers of American values that are linked together in American ideology that there's a relationship between uh, the identity and the values of a family with the work that's involved in order to support that family. 
uh, there's a relationship between uh, a patriotic love of country and nation and the importance of doing work and uh, you know it comes all the way from the Puritan work ethic of the colonial days, as well as the relationship between strong families and a stronger nation. So families, work, and patriotism are ideas that are linked together really carefully. So there's a very real sense, and you can, you can feel this in the ad, that uh, America the Beautiful is being linked to the idea of whether or not uh, families are able to exist as American families pursuing the American dream, uh, which is predicated on whether or not they're able to engage in the work that they need in order to be a legitimate American family, uh, as well as the work that they deserve as, uh, as good American families with uh, a strong work ethic. Okay, so what we've done in this lesson is try to f uh, focus on a number of different ways of understanding the context uh, of a rhetorical act, which is the first key component of neo-Aristotelian criticism. We want to remember that neo-Aristotelian criticism focuses on situational persuasion strategies. And so, because of that, the first step of uh, neo-Aristotelian criticism is reconstructing the context. And through our research and analysis, we can focus on this context in a number of different ways. Uh, the exigences, audiences, and constraints of the rhetorical situation, the supertext that precedes and includes and surrounds the rhetorical act, and the discursive formation of uh, discourse rules and norms that govern how communicators and audiences perceive and understand the reality. Okay, so in the next lesson in this two-part series on neo-Aristotelian criticism, we're going to focus on the next two steps, which are analysis based on the canons of rhetoric and then assessing the impacts of the audience. See you next time.